good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Before we get started, I just want to make uh, an announcement uh, and also give a word of thanks to Margaret Gratz, uh, Ron Stevens, Glen Glenda Seegers, Julie Battle, other members of the Friends of the Library Board, uh, our president, Becky Rollins, for their efforts uh, so far this year in support of the library uh, and putting together our our fundraiser, A Novel Affair. If y'all not not aware of this, March the 10th at the Summit Center, we're having Chef John Currents come. He's going to cook a meal for us. We're going to have a good time. If you don't have your tickets, um, we're not the friends are not selling individual tickets until March the 1st. But you can get together with your friends and neighbors and buy a table. There's like maybe five tables left. So if you don't have a uh, table for this, uh, talk to Margaret after the program. Love to see you there in support of the library. Thank y'all. Welcome to Lunching with Books. And our speaker just arrived. Um, <laughs> Uh, as I said, Jeff and I were planning our routine so um, to, to entertain you, but we are all in for a treat today. Uh, David Cruz's book is the Mississippi Book of Quotations, and some people from Tupelo are quoted. I think Elvis got the most uh, quotes, uh, but anyway, I thought that was interesting. Jack Reed and Scott Reed are quoted, and George McLean and... Um, Anyway, so we are, rep we are represented um, in the book. Just a little bit about David. David serves as clerk of court for the United States District Court in the Northern District of Mississippi. He is a former United States Marshal who spent 12 years with the Justice Department in a variety of law enforcement and anti-terrorism roles. Uh, David was one of the boys of spring. He... Uh, was William Winter's press secretary and uh, helped get him elected. Uh, he also is um, produced a documentary film, The Toughest Job, that won a regional Emmy for Best Historical Documentary. And in the 80s, he served as executive director of CREATE, the state's largest community foundation. And when he was in his 20s, David hiked the entire 450 miles of the Natchez Trace from Natchez to Nashville. And uh, he is thought to be the first person to hike that ancient trail since the 1800s. So I'm sure that was quite an adventure. Uh, he graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from the University of the South in Swanee. And um, he is a mountain climber. And he's climbed with some of the people here. Are these your fellow mountaineers? Some of them are. Were you the Sherpa or were they? I, <laughs> I, I had the strong legs. They had the strong minds. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, but he is a marathoner. And David and his wife, Claire, have twins affectionately known as the Doublets. And they live in Oxford. But anyway, welcome, David. Thank y'all. Um, I hope I'm not late. But I had the chief judge uh, had declared a meeting, and and I was required to be there. And when a federal judge tells you to be somewhere, it's really wise to be there. <clears throat> Thank you, Margaret, for inviting me over today. It's a really treat to be with everybody and share a little bit of the flavor of uh, my book. It's a real delight to be back in Tupelo, where I lived for about four years back in the 80s. And um, uh, several of my mountain climbing buddies and other good friends I see here. Um, I'm suspicious about some of their levels of reading comprehension. Um, as, as Jack Reed used to say, Big Jack, as I called him to distinguish him from Jack Jr., Education is to economic development what fertilizer is to farming. I think some of my buddies, uh, uh, all, all of us, in fact, needed a little bit more fertilizer when we were growing up. 
a little bit more education. When I leave here today, I'm heading down straight to Greenville, Mississippi, um, down on the Mississippi River to handle some court matters. And so I'll be traveling from here, right here in the heart of the hill country, down, down to the Delta with its dramatic cultural differences. <clears throat> this reminds me of a story that, uh, that kind of captures the distinct difference between our two regions. When I, when I first met Judge Alan Pepper, um, in Cleveland, Mississippi, a few days before he was sworn in as a federal judge down in Cleveland. Um, first thing Judge Pepper said to me, I'd never met him before, first things out of his mouth was, Dave, uh, he said, um, uh, aren't you from the hills? And I said, yes, sir, I am. My, my great-grandparents lived in Pontotoc. I grew up in Oxford. My mom was from Blue Mountain originally. Uh, I definitely grew up in the hills. And he said, do you know what the first question you guys from the hills ask anybody when you meet them? And I thought for a minute and said, well, I'm not exactly sure, sir. And he said, I'll tell you what the first question y'all ask somebody is. You all ask them, what church do you go to? <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, sometimes I think we do do that. And he says, down here in the Delta, we do things a little bit differently. He said, the first question we ask somebody is, what whiskey do you drink? <clears throat> and then we know what church you go to. <laughs> So, you know, I, all my life, ever since I was in high school, I've been reading everything I can get my hands on. And, and, and uh, I, I, for me to embed anything in my mind, I generally have to write it down. So every time I'd read anything or listen to great music on the radio, um, I'd all, if it was a great piece of language, I'd always write it down. And about two years ago, so this has been going on for 40 years, and, you know, originally I started reading Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln and, and Mark Twain. But over time, I, I just started concentrating on Mississippi writers because there's no place on earth that has more rich literature and more rich music than we do. And uh, about two years ago, I discovered that I had about 2,500 great pithy quotations. And I, 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 uh, I said, you know, well, I, I ought to... I just have this jumble of notebooks all with, with my handwriting, and I said, I ought to put this together and try to come up with a book for it. And so I divided it, as, you'll, as you may see if you look at the book, into 60, 65 different categories, these over 2,000 quotations into 65 great themes and categories. And I went to a publisher, and he was so excited, and he, he decided to publish the book. And, um, and so there you go. So that was kind of the kernel that, 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 that led me to, uh, to put this book together. So I think most of y'all will agree with me that Mississippi is, we got the finest people anywhere. We're a state full of mysteries and contradictions and generosity, violence, vivid language, iconic music, and great storytelling. Perhaps our greatest, most lasting contribution to the world is our writers and musicians. The fact that y'all are here in this room tells me we have something in common. I don't think you'd be here if you didn't appreciate uh, and love good books and ideas and and language and words and Mississippi. So I, you know, I've always read everything I can get my hands on and 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 then jotted them down. And I, I take great literature and vivid language and powerful storytelling to heart. So let me relate a couple of stories which kind of explain my personal relationship to this book uh, and to the quotations in it. As a young boy, we left Mississippi for a few years and moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, we were up there for five years before we moved back to Mississippi. My dad got his master's and PhD at, uh, in, uh, in 19th and tw in something arcane, 19th and 20th century British literature. Um, and when I tell folks that I spent five years in Charlottesville, they brighten up and say, oh, you went to Mr. Jefferson's university. You went, to, you went to the University of Virginia. And I have to say, no, I went to Venable Elementary School. <laughs> so in, in Charlottesville, uh, um, we lived in these old U.S. Marine barracks. My dad had been in the United States Navy during World War II, and so we got to live in these Marine barracks for $21 a month. That was my mom, my dad, and f their four kids. 
Um, it was a really Spartan kind of operation. If any of y'all were in the Marines, you, you know, uh, they're not, and Jack having been in the Army, they're, they're not big on, on uh, putting you in very palatial quarters. So, so about it, but, you know, some of y'all will know that William Faulkner left Mississippi for a stint and lived in Charlottesville, and he was the writer in residence at the University of Virginia. And he was a writer in residence during the period of time when we were living up in Charlottesville. And so about a, about a half mile from our Spartan military barracks, William Faulkner lived in this gorgeous, sumptuous antebellum home. Well, up in Virginia, an antebellum home can be a pre-Civil Civil War home. It can also be a pre-Revolutionary War home. He lived in this pre-Revolutionary War home about a half mile from our, our, our place. And there was a hay barn behind Mr. Faulkner's house. Well, my brother and I, you know, typical little boys, we just loved hay barns, so we would we would go to the hay barn um, quite frequently and play war and play fort and jump off the out of the hay loft and and have the best time. One day we were leaving the hay the hay barn and we were walking past Mr. Faulkner's house, and there was a little apple orchard um, right next to the house. It was just kind of a low slung uh, brick wall around the uh, demarcating the apple orchard and. It was the fall, there were apples in the trees, so I climbed up one of the trees and was chunking apples down to my brother. Well, unbeknownst to us, we're concentrating on these apples, and unbeknownst to me, Mr. Faulkner walks out on his front porch and spies us. He walks down into the apple orchard, and he looks up at me and says, what are you boys doing? And uh, I started stammering and, and hunting for a good lie. And so I'm going, well, sir, well, sir. And I'm searching and searching for a lie, but I'm not clever enough to come with, with anything. So I finally just have to blurt out the truth. And I said, well, sir, well, sir, we're stealing apples. <laughs> and so he kind of chuckled and, and said, well, go right ahead. He said, I, I think if I had come up with a good lie, good clever lie, he'd have called the constabulary on me because I could only blurt out the truth. He let us uh, take those apples. So, so. You know, the first time, the only time I met William Faulkner, I was stealing from him. And I think he, I think he make a pretty good case that I'm stealing from him still today. Um, because if you, if you take a look at this book, William Faulkner, inevitably, as prolific and profound a writer as he is, he's quoted more in the book than anyone else. Um, but I think Faulkner wouldn't mind the fact that I'm still a thief, uh, even to the, this day. Because Faulkner one time said, a writer would steal from his own grandmother. Ode on a Grecian urn is worth any number of little old ladies. <laughs> now the second story that kind of gives you a sense of my connection to these lines uh, it, uh, comes from an encounter I had with Miss Eudora Welty. Back in the early 1980s, I, I lived in Jackson before I moved up to, to Tupelo. And um, back in those days, there was no internet. And I, 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 there weren't any personal computers, at least not to my knowledge. I, um, and, and so the only place that you could get the New York Times back in those days in, in Jackson, Mississippi, was at Parkins Pharmacy, right next to Jitney, Jitney, the Jitney Jungle, Jitney 14, there in Bell Haven. So I'd go and work out every day at the y local YMCA, and all as I was driving back to work at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I would uh, go by Parkins Pharmacy and pick up a, a New York Times. Every once in a while, I'd see Miss Welty in there, driving precariously up to, to Parkins Pharmacy to buy her New York Times. So, um, and so I thought to myself, well, gosh, if Miss Welty is spunky enough to want to read the New York Times every day, I'll just buy two and I'll deliver her, her New York Times. So I went in there that, that next day, and, and I talked to Bill behind the counter. I said, Bill, I'm going to buy two papers today, and I'm going to deliver one to Miss Welty. Now, she asked uh, who's delivering it. Tell, tell, her, tell her you don't know. And so about two weeks, so, so that day I, I parked my little pickup truck about a uh, half a block from Miss Welty's house. I ran across her yard, dropped to the New York Times on her front doorstep, ran back to my truck, went, went to work, back to work. This went on for about two weeks, and I'll go in the Parkins one day, and and uh, um, Bill behind the counter says, "Dave, Dave," he whispers to me, "Miss Welty was in here this morning. She asked us if we were delivering her New York Times, and I I said, "No, ma'am, we're not delivering your New York Times." And she said, "What's well, the oddest thing? It appears on my doorstep every day. Do you know who's deliver who, who's bringing it?" And he lied and said, "True to his word, he lied and said, "No, ma'am, I do not." 
And uh, so the next, so the next day, I'm, I park my truck a half block from her, her house. I run across her yard. I drop the, the New York Times on her front doorstep. And and as I'm running back across her her yard, she had been hiding underneath the steering wheel of her car out in her little her little gravel driveway. And she flings the door open and she raises up and says, "Aha! I found you out." So she so so she and I've never met her before. So so she invites me into her house, and at at one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we drink a glass of of Maker's Mark whiskey <laughs> in her in her little kitchen. And so I've always felt that I was amply paid for being Miss Welty's New York Times because about once a month for about the next eight years. And, uh, um, she, uh, she'd invite me in about once a month, and we'd drink a glass of whiskey at one o'clock in the afternoon and 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 talk. Mainly, she did the talking and, and wove great stories. I was always grateful that Governor Winter never found out what I was doing at one o'clock in the afternoon once once a month. <laughs> so I think, as I, as I mentioned, the, this book contains over two thousand great lines that are written or uttered or composed by more than 300 different Mississippians. Now, there are two lines that sum up why I put this book together. The first is from Miss Welty, who once wrote, one place understood helps us understand all places better. And I think Mississippi is worth struggling to understand, and sometimes it is a struggle. Without a doubt, this collection helps us better understand Mississippi from the perspective of our best writers, musicians, playwrights, artists, storytellers, and athletes. And the second line that I think sums up what this book is about comes from Beth Henley's play, Crimes of the Heart, where she says, it's a human need to talk about our lives. It's an important human need. I really like that. It's a human need to talk about our lives. It's an important human need. So without a doubt, I think y'all agree with me. Mississippians love to talk, to weave stories, to write, to sing. It's just really in our DNA. So I had a lot of fun putting this book together because if, if, if you're from Mississippi, you've pretty much hit the trifecta if you like books and music and storytelling. So let me share just a, a, a short passage from the introduction that I wrote to the book, which is at the core of, of why I, I think this book is important and why I think and why I put it together. So I, I say in the introduction, Mississippi, a fiercely complex land, is both mesmerizing and baffling. Our country's most impoverished state is undeniably our richest when it comes to writing, lyrics, and stories. Economically poor, Mississippi is immeasurably rich in words and ideas that bubble to the surface in great literature, in songwriting, and in storytelling. The Mississippi Book of Quotations brings together the artistry and cadences of the world's greatest storytellers. It blends powerful observations on love, truth, lies, failure, fear, humility, evil, drinking, death, endurance, and sacrifice. The wide breadth of themes and emotions that make up life well lived or poorly lived. And as those who dig deeply into the book will observe, Cruelty and courage are close companions in a culture that spawned both Theodore Bilbo and Medgar Evers. Nobility and depravity exist side by side in this collection of quotations. But thankfully, the heartfelt, the insightful, and the uplifting far outweigh the dispiriting lines. So the book is wide-ranging. It, it, it covers the, the gamut from the extraordinary insights of William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Beth Henley, Donna Tartt, Tennessee Williams, Leontine Price, all the way to a high school football coach in Mississippi who, who once during a practice said to his, his players, you boys pair off. Pair off in threes. That's about as wide a gamut. If you go from William Faulkner and Eudora Welty to pair off in threes, that's about as broad as it gets. I think you'll find that each of the quotations in the book stands on its own, but within each thematic category, there's a narrative thread that runs through each category and tells a broader, overarching, really more textured uh, story about our state. As Richard Grant writes in Dispatches from Pluto, Mississippi is the best-kept secret in America. Nowhere else is so poorly understood, 
by outsiders, so unfairly maligned, so surreal and peculiar, so charming and maddening. So, so I have to say this about Dispatches from Pluto. When I first saw that in, in Square Books, I saw the title, Dispatches from Pluto. I said, I gotta get this book. This, this must be about outer space. Um, and then I bought the book and, and I discovered, well, it, it is about outer space. It's about the Mississippi Delta. <laughs> So listen to some of the lines I think truly capture the dynamics and the chemistry and the emotions that we have about Mississippi. Because there's really no better way to capture the character of our state than through our words. Faulkner writes, loving all of Mississippi, even while you had to hate some of it. You don't love because, you love despite, not for the virtues, but despite the faults. That's a recognition by Faulkner of our state's complexity. We're a mixture of incredible generosity, friendliness, and accomplishments, but simultaneously we're full of vexing problems, violence, illiteracy, and poverty. Recently, Mississippi uh, native Stuart Stevens wrote in the Daily Beast, Mississippi is the Ireland of America. It's a green place where literature and music are valued more than acquiring wealth. Drinking and fighting are accepted and often so, uh, respected social endeavors. And defending one's honor is still considered worthy, if not mandatory. <laughs> Over the years, many of our brightest folks have, have left our state while looking for brighter prospects elsewhere. The actor Morgan Freeman said, growing up, my goal was always to leave Mississippi. But as Morgan said upon returning to live in the little community of Charleston where he grew up, I can live anywhere I want, and Mississippi is where I want to live. Anybody know who Wyatt Cooper is? Anderson, <laughs> Anderson Cooper. Good. Man, we're going to have a good pop quiz at the end of this, this little talk. So Wyatt Cooper is, was, is, was Anderson Cooper's father. Anderson Cooper, the, the anchor was CNN. Wyatt Cooper grew up in Mississippi. He was a Mississippian. He grew up in a hard, on a tough, hard scrabble farm uh, in Mississippi. He went on to become an actor and a writer, and, and then he, uh, lo and behold, he, he uh, married the heiress of Gloria Vanderbilt and had Anderson Cooper. Uh, so in, in his book called Families, uh, Wyatt Cooper writes, we have in truth never left home. We have never left Mississippi, for we carry it around with us. Those of you who may have left Mississippi for a while like I did, I think that's really, really, that really resonates. That's really true. Mississippi is also a, a land of really rich characters. As Richard Grant again notes, Mississippians have a genius for charging after phantoms and lost causes. A perfect example of this occurred right here in Tupelo. Uh, the, it's the bizarre tale of the karate instructor. Y'all all know this story. The karate instructor who sent Ryson to both Justice Court Judge Sadie Holland and former President Barack Obama. A writer observed in GQ magazine, spend a week or two in Tupelo, Mississippi, and you begin to wonder if the air down there perhaps contains an element that causes dreams to ignite and burn hotter and stranger than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> In his book, An American Insurrection, William Doyle writes, James Meredith was a character so colorful and complex, he could have only sprung from the rich soil of Mississippi. Right here in Tupelo, you have Steve Holland. <laughs> Would anyone dispute my characterization of him as a character? <laughs> uh, um, once on the floor of the, of the Mississippi legislature, Representative Holland uttered these words in a harangue against the State Board of Cosmetology. He said, the chairman has informed me that I don't have enough hair to talk about the cosmetologist. <laughs> but I believe that is the sorriest agency in state government. This board's a rotten mess, a teetotal rotten mess. Our own Steve Holland. The people of, of Oxford um, back in the 30s and 40s nicknamed William Faulkner, some of y'all I'm sure know this, nicknamed him Count No Count. And that comes because, you know, he had, Faulkner had kind of an aristocratic bearing. Um, 
But people in Oxford just thought he was no count. He didn't do anything. He just wrote. He didn't brick lay bricks. He did. He wasn't a carpenter. Um, he he wasn't a blacksmith. He wasn't engaged in any valuable practical pursuit in life. So they called him Count No Count. Um, um, so, but nonetheless, while Faulkner lived out in Hollywood writing screenplays, Faulkner wrote home to a friend, I like my town, my land, my people, my life, and am, and, and am unhappy away from it. When his Hollywood producer uh, asked Faulkner, well, what, what are you going to do? Faulkner's succinct response was, go home to Mississippi. So you could take Mississippi, out, uh, you could take Faulkner out of Mississippi, but you couldn't take Mississippi out of Faulkner. And, of course, he returned home. John Grisham writes in his novel, A Time to Kill, the North was where he lived and worked, but it wasn't home. Home was where Mama lived, back in Mississippi. Such is the allure of, of Mississippi to those of us who were born here, and I think increasingly to those um, um, who were born elsewhere, witness the folks coming into town and to hear from, to, to work at Toyota or Nissan or so many other uh, companies that have moved into our state. There is a real allure uh, to our state. As the historian V.O. Key observed, northerners, provincials that they are, regard the south as one large Mississippi. Southerners, with their eye for distinction, place Mississippi in a class by itself. <laughs> so both for good and ill, I think we indeed are in a class by ourselves. Perhaps like many of you, I've always been attracted to the power of words and the rhythm and cadences of good phrases and stories. And as I noted earlier, I've always written them, written them down, the great, pithy, heartfelt, poignant, amusing, insightful lines that I'd come across. So the majority of the quotations in, in my book come from novels, from histories, from memoirs and songs written by Mississippians. But this collection is also interspersed with a great with a great number of lines by non-Mississippians talking about Mississippi. For example, Martin Luther King famously said in his I Have a Dream speech, let freedom ring from every hill and molehill in Mississippi. Let freedom ring. And Abraham Lincoln, who said upon the, whoever thought that, that you know, you'd have a book on Mississippi quotes and quote Abraham Lincoln. But Abraham Lincoln had several things to say about Mississippi, including this, upon the fall of Vicksburg. The Mississippi River now goes unvexed to the sea. I love that word, unvexed. The Mississippi River now goes unvexed to the sea. And Saturday Night Live's description of the Mississippi legislature as 30 hissing possums in a sack. <laughs> now, I grew up in the country, and if any of y'all have ever been around one hissing possum in a sack, you cannot imagine what 30 hissing possums in a sack are, but that's how Saturday Night Live described the Mississippi legislature. And Paul Simon, the, the great singer and songwriter in his famous song, Graceland, uh, sings this, the Mississippi Delta shines like a national guitar. And if you look at the, at the Delta from, from above, from a, on a map, or if you're flying over it, it is indeed shaped like a map, and of course, it is the wellspring of some of the most important music, blues music, uh, in our nation's history. All right, so, so many of the quotes in this volume come not from, from my readings, um, but from, from people and events that I've intersected with. For, for example, uh, before I started working for the federal courts 10 years ago, I was, as Margaret noted, a U.S. Marshal. One of the more amusing lines in this book comes from an early morning arrest I made up in, uh, up in Tippa County. Um, I was at home one night, lived on the outskirts of Oxford. I was at home about 9 o'clock at night. I get a phone call from a fugitive task force out in Texas. They had been hunting for two years for a guy who was on the Texas 10 Most Wanted list. Now, arguably, a guy on the Texas 10 Most Wanted list is, is much more dangerous than someone on the, the on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, and this guy was immensely dangerous. He had murdered, he was a double murderer, he was a cocaine trafficker, and had all sorts of other charges against him. So they, um, they called me because one of their informants had alerted them that he'd gotten a phone call from this, this top 10 fugitive um, who, uh, who, who, 
had gotten a phone call from him, and uh, they gave me the number. Well, I was able to trace the number that, that he had called from to a pay phone uh, up in Corinth, Mississippi. Now, most of us here know what a pay phone is. <laughs> you two over there may not know what a pay phone is. <laughs> but there once existed in the land of <laughs> days of yore something called pay phones. So, I, so this is 9.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night. I grab one of my deputies, and we drive to Corinth and, and find that payphone, which was at a flea market, uh, uh, in the, on the grounds of a flea market in Corinth. So we interviewed a bunch of people um, who, were, who were near that, that uh, payphone, got some information. And with that information, we were able to track this guy, this double murderer, from Corinth, Mississippi, up into Tennessee, over into Alabama. And then three days later, back into Mississippi. And we finally caught up with him at about 6 o'clock one morning on the gr uh, in a restaurant on the grounds of the First Monday Flea Market in Ripley, Mississippi. Now, my whole life, I had wanted to go to First Monday, <laughs> but I had never been. This was my first trip there. So we catch up with this guy. He's about 6 foot 5, has a blonde hair, red beard, and I'm nowhere near 6 foot 5. Nor is my deputy. And um, our whole goal in life uh, w with the U.S. Marshals was, whenever we made arrest, was, was to keep the public safe, was to keep ourselves safe, and keep the bad guys safe. And so we, uh, my deputy and I got a cup of coffee. We were in hunting clothes. Uh, we sat in a booth behind where, where our uh, um, fugitive was, was eating breakfast, 6 o'clock in the morning. We waited till some people cleared out where there was no one really near him, so we wouldn't endanger anybody. We felt we could uh, safely arrest him, and we didn't want him leaving this kind of contained environment. So we drew down on him. <clears throat> First thing to say is, you know, so our badge say, U.S. Marshals, you keep your hands where we can see them, and everybody else in here keep your seat. Um, we didn't know if he didn't have a buddy in there somewhere. <clears throat> and so uh, we, we get this guy handcuffed. Um, get a, a gun out of his boot. He had a gun down in his boot. And my whole goal in life now is to, is to get this back guy to our federal lockup in Oxford, Mississippi, and keep everybody safe. And so we're busting him out of there. And uh, this little old lady um, starts, starts going, sir, sir. And, uh, she, and she starts making a beeline for me. And I'm trying to get out of there before she catches up with me and criticizes me for arresting this nice young man. And, uh, but she finally catches up with me, and she goes, sir, sir. I just want you to know, that was the most dramatic breakfast I've ever eaten. <laughs> she went on to say, that was better than TV. <laughs> I said, ma'am, that was my most dramatic breakfast too. <laughs> I had never thought of breakfast before as being dramatic, and I've never had a dramatic breakfast since then. <laughs> and, on the, and on the topic of breakfast, Beth Henley's... Um, I can't resist Beth Henley's uh, fine scene and dialogue in Crimes of the Heart, where she has one of her char characters say, Old granddaddy told us not to cry anymore because he was going to take us out to get banana splits for breakfast. <laughs> now, what's not to like about a granddaddy that, that, that gets, <laughs> gets you banana splits for breakfast? Um, my kids are in high school, um, but one day I aspire to be a granddaddy who gets, gives his grandkids banana splits for breakfast and maybe for lunch and dinner, too. My wife would say that's about the only thing I'm any good at is would be something like that that's unhealthy. Uh, I, I want to see a show of hands. How many of y'all in here know Judge Glenn Davidson? Everybody. Everybody knows Judge Davidson. He, of course, is a federal judge in my court lives here in Tupelo. Now, when a, when, a, when, uh, when a federal judge goes on the bench, a bailiff opens court by saying, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. United States District Court for the Northern District of Mississippi is now open according to law. The Honorable uh, Glenn Davidson presiding, God save the United States in this honorable court. We had a new bailiff, a new court security officer um, uh, who'd just taken the job one day, and he was opening court for Judge Davidson. He got a little bit confused. <laughs> he was trying to open court for the first time. And so he goes, he goes, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. United States District Court for the Northern District of Mississippi is now open according to law. The Honorable Glenn Davidson presiding. And he stops. 
and he cannot remember the rest of it. And he, he goes, and he, he, he seemed tense up, and he goes, uh, uh, the Honorable Glenn Davidson presiding, God help us. <laughs> Oh my God, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't see Ms. Davidson back there. Hey, Bonnie. <laughs> but I would have told that story even if I had seen Bonnie back there. <laughs> God help Bonnie. <laughs> so one, another one of my judges is, uh, is U.S. District Court Judge Neil Biggers, who's originally from Corinth and, of course, lives in Oxford now. He had a horrible case one time. Um, where he was sentencing a father and, and a, a daughter. Um, and they were accused of uh, attempted murder, insurance fraud, all sorts of things. What came out um, uh, as the case was investigated, the, in, what the, the daughter and the father were doing was trying to kill the daughter's husband. They had a couple of kids together, and they were trying to, in, want to get the insurance settlement on the insurance they had brought on, on the husband. Well, as, as the investigation unfolded, it turned out that the, um, um, that the, the, the poor guy that they were trying to murder, the, the husband of this daughter, was not the father of his children. Her father was the father of her children. So you, you had this situation, I don't know if you ever heard the great bluegrass song where I am my own grandpa. Um, so, so the, the, the grandfather was both the grandfather and the father of the children. And um, so Judge Biggers had just never encountered anything quite like this. And so he says, uh, from the bench that day, he puts his, his reading glasses down on the bridge of his nose and, and peers at the two defendants and says, I've been, on the, I've been on the bench for a long time. I thought I'd seen everything. But I was wrong. <laughs> now, one of my all-time favorite lines was uttered during testimony in a federal criminal trial in Oxford. A fellow was on the stand, and he got all tangled up in his testimony. I think he was probably trying to perjure himself. And he got so tangled up that he finally just blurted out, you know, it's hard to remember the truth when there's so much truth to remember. <laughs> So like that, like that witness try, struggling to tell the truth, I, th I really think at its core this book is all about truth. The truth about human nature, the truth about civil rights, the truth about, uh, uh, about fear, about freedom, justice, and even the truth about our understanding of the truth. As Miss Welty once observed, opposite things are often done in getting at the truth. Miss Welty, Welty also said, art is never the voice of a country. It is an even more precious thing. It is the voice of the individual. It is the voice of the individual doing its best to speak, not comfort of any sort, but truth. So sometimes the truth is noble and sometimes it's downright ugly. In the civil rights section of, of my book, you have Fannie Lou Hamer's great line, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you can sense and feel the pain and worry and weary, weariness she is experiencing in the constant battle she was engaged in to secure basic voting rights. You have Merle Evers' heartbreaking comment, a map of Mississippi was a reminder not of geography, but of atrocities. And of course, Merle suffered one of the worst atrocities of all in, her, in the driveway of her Jackson home when Medgar Evers was gunned down by a sniper. Now, interesting uh, side note to that is many of you know the sniper who killed Medgar Evers was Byron de la Beckwith, um, who later ran, astonishingly, ran for lieutenant governor of our state. Anyone, anyone remember the slogan he used? The sl his slogan for that campaign for lieutenant governor was, elect a straight shooter. An elect a straight shooter. Isn't that kind of, that's horrific when you understand the, the full import of, of, uh, of, of what, he had, what he had done, the murder he had committed. There's also the stalwart understanding of James Meredith in the 1960s who said, a person is no better 
is no better off enjoying nine of ten rights than none of ten. My thing is the whole hog, either all citizenship rights or none. I think it's also appropriate to look at civil rights from the vantage point of James Thomas Bell, one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Many of y'all may know him by his nickname, Cool Papa, Cool Papa Bell. And Cool Papa Bell said this on not ever being able to play in the major leagues because the major leagues was segregated um, back at that time. So commenting on not being able to play in the, in the major leagues because of the color of his skin, Cool Papa said, so many people say that I was born too soon, but that's not true. They opened the doors too late. You also have the perseverance, courage, and, and resolve of Medgar Evers, who had a calm and clear understanding of the stakes involved when he said, I do not plan to leave Mississippi. I am anchoring myself here for better or worse. I hope for better, but if worse comes, I'll be in the middle of it. So those are uplifting and courageous words, but I do my best to tell it all in this volume. I really think you have to tell it all, and including the darkness. So brace yourself, as, as Richard Grant again observes in Dispatches from Pluto, Mississippi had the most lynchings, the worst Klan violence, and the staunchest, so, staunchest resistance to, to the civil rights movement. The plain, ugly, treacherous truth is that our state produced vile, inflammatory, poisonous statements from Ross Barnett and many others. As Ross Barnett said, no school will be integrated in Mississippi while I am your governor. And James K. Vardaman said this, why squander money on Negro education when the only effect is to spoil a good field hand and make an insolent cook? Now fortunately, as I've, I've observed before, the great insightful heartfelt lines of Mississippians far outweigh the wicked mean-spirited and treacherous lines. So to turn to an uplifting category for a moment, such as, as love, um, we have Miss Eudora's understanding of what, he, what she called the deep-grained habit of love. There's her wonderful line, the habit of love, the habit of love cuts through confusion and stumbles and contrives its way out of difficulty. My, my bride would say I'm still stumbling and have not even come close to you know, contriving my way out of difficulty. Or you also have the fine, spare insight from Intruder in the Dust by Faulkner when he said, he loved the old few simple things, a little music, a hearth, any child, a god, a heaven which a man may avail himself of without having to wait to die. And what of the heartfelt lyric from country musician Jimmy Rogers from Meridian, Mississippi, whose line, why should I be lonesome when nobody is lonesome for me? And, that, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a line that makes you, makes you ache. It's so powerful and hungry. And it's, I love country music. And it is unlike so much of the insipid stuff that passes for country music today. That's a really powerful line. Why should I be lonesome? when nobody is lonesome for me. But as soon as you think that, that love in this volume is always ponderous, you, you, you encounter wickedly amusing uh, lines on love, such as this from Shelby Foote, the great historian. I think Faulkner loved mules, loved mules as much as people, maybe more. <laughs> and this from Harriet uh, DeSalle Kirkendall. I taught Willie Morris algebra in high school. Willie always said he liked me better than algebra, and I knew that to be the gospel truth. <laughs> now, humor is, is definitely one of our finer attributes. Private John Allen, everybody here know who Private John Allen was? From, so Private John Allen often employed humor in Congress to secure projects for his North Mississippi district, the districts where you and I live. Uh, as when he claimed on the floor of, of Congress in his bid to secure a national fish, hat, fish hatchery, there are little fishes all over America clamoring to be born in Tupelo, Mississippi. <laughs> Don't you love that? Little fishes clamoring, clamoring to be born. Allen also used humor, humor to get elected. When running against a Civil War general who was the prohibitive favorite, Allen urged, all you generals out there, vote for my opponent, General Tucker. And all of you who are privates, vote for me, Private John Allen. 
Well, you know the simple math there. You know, there are only a handful of generals and there are thousands of privates. And so he, he rode that irresistible line to victory and became our United States Congressman. And, and in one of the best retorts ever uttered on the face of this earth, Con you know, John Allen was known for, for bringing um, projects back to, to, to North Mississippi, um, which was in dire need back in those days and, and even today of, 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 of an influx of, 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 um, of money. And so in one of the best retorts ever, um, um, Congressman W.B. Walker, uh, who was from up north, said, said of, of John Allen, said, why I look at John Allen sitting over there, he's literally fat and pregnant on the people's money. To which Allen responded while patting his stomach, when I'm delivered of this child, if it's a girl, I shall name her Martha Washington. And if it's a boy, I shall name him George Washington. And if it's a jackass, I will name it W.B. Walker. <laughs> And in a, in a quip considerably finer than any we heard in last year's presidential campaign, Leroy Percy from the Mississippi Delta once said of James K. Vardaman, between barbarism and Wall Street, I rather think Vardaman leans towards barbarism. <laughs> if you know anything about, about Vardaman, you'd think yeah, that's exactly right. He did lean towards barbarism. Now, last fall, uh, in the back and forth between the two major presidential candidates, about um, there was a lot said about lying. But those barbs that those two candidates, you know, threw at each other, were really tame uh, and unimaginative, and lacked the sting of a line uttered at the Neshoba County Fair by one Mississippi politician, who described his opponent in this way. He is a willful, obstinate, unsavory, obnoxious, pusillanimous, pestilential, pernicious, and perversible liar. Now, if you're going to call somebody a liar, that's the way to do it. So Mississippians, you know, can call somebody a liar imaginatively and, 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 uh, and, and right. So, and what are we to make of this from, from another Mississippi congressman, Percy Quinn? There comes a time in a statesman's life when he must rise above principle. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. And so to shift gears dramatically from the outlandish notion that we must rise above, above principle, we have the stalwart integrity of Senator John Stennis, who observed to newly elected U.S. Senators, rookie U.S. Senators, some politicians grow and others swell. Make sure you grow. Um, and, I, you know, that's something I think we all endeavor to do is, is not to swell, but to grow. And I think our politicians in Washington perhaps need that, that adage from Senator Stennis now perhaps more than ever. Now, some of the most wonderful lines are written about women, especially feisty women. Faulkner wrote of his aunt, when Aunt Bama dies, either she or God has got to leave heaven because both of them can't be boss. <laughs> Paige Mitchell, author of the novel A Wilderness of Monkeys. Has anyone in here ever read A Wilderness of Monkeys? Great. Great. Not, I stumbled across that in, in my effort to read everything that had ever been written by a Mississippian. Paige Mitchell wrote this novel, A Wilderness of Monkeys, and it's well worth your time. It, it's a novel, but it was loosely based on a trial that had taken place in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And Paige Mitchell observes in, in that novel, every small town needs one like me, a spicy old spinster that goes around meddling in other people's business. And I think, you know, most of us at some point in our lives have known someone like that who likes to meddle in other people's business. And you have the Delta Bluesman Sun House, who with wonder and astonishment uh, said, these old guitars are just like women. When you get them out in public, you just never know what they're going to do. <laughs> and, and in his short story collection entitled Short Mean Fiction, the artist Bill Dunlap has a woman acidly tell a man who's hitting on her, Honey, you'd sooner get a certified letter from Satan as to mess with me tonight. 
Now, my great great grandfather uh, was was Mark Perrin Lowry, General Mark Perrin Lowry, uh, from uh, Tippa County, from Blue Mountain. And he founded Blue Mountain College. It's you know that, that's a bit north of here, up in Tippa County. Uh, now, General Lowry, General Lowry was gone for about the, for most of the four years of the Civil War, fighting at Shiloh, at Chickamauga, at Franklin, Tennessee, and other engagements. A historian once noted this great line. Some folks in Tippa County thought Mrs. Lowry was a better general than General Lowry because while the general was off at, at war for four years, supported by captains and colonels and adjutants, Mrs. Lowry stayed home and commanded an army of nine children by herself and single-handedly kept her army fed, clothed, and educated. And you, ha you have to agree that there's a whole lot of really deft generalship um, by women who were not generals. Um, so, um, but I, on, on the women topic, I'll end, I'll end with this. It, it doesn't get much better than this from William Faulkner, who wrote, I had learned how to approach language, words, with a kind of alert respect as you approach dynamite, even with joy as you approach women perhaps with the same secretly unscrupulous intentions. <laughs> All right, now just to turn to men for just a moment and not neglect, neglect the men folk entirely, Miss Welty once wrote, in the end, it takes the phenomenal neatness of housekeeping, in the end, it takes the phenomenal neatness of housekeeping to put it through the heads of men that they are swine. <clears throat> My bride would definitely agree with that. <laughs> so I'll end this litany of quotations with one that I think makes for a fitting conclusion to my remarks. It's a valuable, valuable and true line from the novelist Richard Ford that I think really sums up the purpose of my book. He said this, deep down, we are all looking for a meaningful human connection every chance we get. So I'm delighted to have been here today and to hopefully through these words make a meaning connection with each of y'all. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to take any questions. Um, and if you don't have any questions, I'll give y'all a pop quiz. So, <laughs> oh, oh, and I will say this too, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you look at the book, there's a, right behind the introduction, there's a, um, there's a place, We've almost sold out of, of, of the first edition of this, of this book, and so the publisher's coming out with the second edition, and so I had the idea, I was hoping maybe it would sell out, and, and in fact it has. So we're going to do a second edition, and, and it's going to be an expanded edition. I've already read enough that I've gotten about 100 more great quotations, um, and that will go in the, the new and expanded edition. But if you have any lines that I've missed, and no doubt I've missed tons of them, I would love it if you would call me or you can go online to, the, to msbookofquotations.com and there's a place there where you can enter and, and say, you idiot, you missed this, this is the best line of all time. So uh, if you go to msbookofquotations.com and you have some great lines that need to go in the next volume, I'd really appreciate it. When I was at Gumtree Books um, back in November, uh, signing books, um, uh, a, a young lady came up to me and, and, and told me a great line. She said, um, um, uh, talking about her father, he said, my daddy, he not only writes in cursive, he speaks in cursive. <laughs> <laughs> so, Margaret, thank you. And if anyone has a question, just... Jack, Jack and Reed and Bru and, and Bruiser, they they need more fertilizer. I can assure you. <laughs> I saved you, I saved everybody some money then. Thank y'all. <laughs>